All right. Hello, everybody, and welcome to this discussion on The Ships of Merrier by Jenny Wirtz. And here I have joining me Dr. Fantasy and Professor Fireballs, or Philip Chase and AP Canavan from A Critical Dragon. So how are you guys doing today? Doing very well, Joanna. Thank you for inviting me here for this discussion. <laughs> I've been looking forward to this very much, and I want everyone to know that we are going to have a halftime show in the middle of this video where AP is going to play that piano that's in the, right behind him there. <laughs> and once again, my nemesis proves why he's a nemesis. And, <laughs> Joanna, it is, it's wonderful to be here I, to discuss this book. I've been really enjoying this series. And because of that, I have a slight confession. Obviously, I made to both of you earlier, which is I, I kind of read a bit ahead. So I'm going to try to be very, very careful not to go further than where we are meant to be in this read along. And it, I got carried away and I was enjoying it so much. So uh, I, I read ahead of it. Wonderful. Do you two maybe want to talk briefly about things that you're enjoying in this, in this series so far? Maybe regarding Jenny's writing or world building, any sort of aspect. Well, yeah. one of the first things is obviously Jenny, as a consummate artist doesn't copy other people's wardrobes and turn up to video things wearing the same outfit. I didn't get the note. Hey, at least we weren't both wearing our white jackets again. <laughs> <laughs> but to, to go to your point, one of the things that I, I really love, I am really loving and enjoying about all of this is the, the writing that works employs, that this is beautiful, rich, lyrical, complex, wonderful language and it is stretching uh, my my knowledge of english there there were at least two occasions i think uh, in reading through that i went i don't recognize that word i'm going to look it up the fact that you know and it was so enjoyable to do that to go that's something i don't know and this is part of the the joy of reading that i had when i was much much younger that when you were first reading fantasy and science fiction and exploring um, adult literature for the first time when you were a child, that there were words and concepts that you, you didn't recognize. No, you understood what they were from context, but you weren't aware of that word. And suddenly it was an avenue to broaden your mind, broaden your vocabulary to, to have new ideas and new ways to think about ideas. And to have that in fantasy writing, a, a genre that is so often maligned for being juvenile and for being aimed at the lowest common denominator and reductive and formulaic, this wondrous language is present all the way through. And that is just something that is a joy and should be celebrated. As much as we love straightforward stories or stories told in, in certain styles. We should love and celebrate the fact that our genre is broad enough, big enough to support whole hosts of styles and approaches. And this is, this is a particular style that appeals to me and it is such a joy to read. Mm, beautifully said. Did you want to add anything to that, Philip? Oh, yeah, I completely agree with AP. The, I, I think I've said before that Jenny Wirtz's prose has a timeless quality to it. It feels timeless. It, uh, it is uh, in, in where it needs to be. It's elevated. Uh, it, she's also capable of getting some wonderful humor across. Um, I'm, this uh, is my third full-length book by Wirtz that I've read, and I've also read one novella now. So I feel like I have a good sense of her style. What I really found myself marveling at during my read of Ships of Merrier is just how nuanced her characters are. And that's a pretty, I mean, there's a, a short list, I think, of authors in fantasy that I think of where the characters feel like people you would meet. Uh, and in a way, it's interesting because, yes, it, it's stylized, but at the same time, I think what Wirtz has done, and, and I, I really look forward to this happening more and more throughout the series, is in the course of her beautifully descriptive writing, 
she explores all these little facets of her characters. And uh, one of the characters in here I've, I've mentioned before in uh, Arathon is, he's one of my favorite characters in literature at this point because of just how nuanced and how fascinating and conflicted and uh, compassionate. And, and uh, I just love the, the, the ways in which I've, I've felt myself more and more attached to the characters in this story, which took me by surprise actually. Uh, so I really enjoy that. And the, the psychological exploration in here is something that I think if you have uh, just a bit of patience and you let yourself ease into these books and become immersed in this world and, and Athera, you're going to feel um, this incredible connection to these characters. So that's something I've really enjoyed in, in Ships of Marrier. Mm, beautifully said. Um, I think I was telling you, Philip, but I actually shared a passage from this book with my mother who has a degree in English and she is something of a pro snob. I don't think she would be offended for me saying that and doesn't read fantasy. She did read Piranesi with me a few years ago and loved that. But I showed her, I think, part of the opening of chapter seven, I think it was. Mm -hmm. And she immediately loved it. Just immediately did not have enough superlatives to talk about how alive the prose was, how rich how lilting, musical. I mean, she just could not gush enough about how much she loved Jenny Wirtz's prose. And I wish I had her here because she, you know, she was saying, she said, that is her style. That is her voice. She's not going to change it. Yeah, and yeah. it's it's to be respected. It is um, part of what makes her, you know, like she could tell that Jenny loves her prose. Like she loves writing. She loves language. And she has such a command with it. And so... Um, I think you have to be able to adjust to that. And I think it, it will be an adjustment if you're used to more straightforward writing styles, as AP was saying. But I do agree with what you said, AP, that it's wonderful that we have um, a genre that allows a diversity of styles. And uh, I also want to echo what you said, Philip. I really enjoyed some of her characterization work, um, specifically how she utilized supporting characters in this one. I just mm -hmm. noticed just little moments where the characters would respond to one another or notice things in one another that I thought were really beautiful. And so it's something I've really enjoyed. And I have really enjoyed the music, the magic, the way that she creates this very vivid world, this ethereal quality. I just think it's beautifully supported by her style too. Yeah. Beautifully said. There's another thing I think that's really admirable about Jenny Wirtz's writing. Either she's just so skilled with words that she convinces me that she's an expert in so many realms, or she is an expert in so many realms. But when she talks about horses, I know she knows what she's talking about. When she talks about ships, I feel like, oh, wow, she also knows ships. Maybe she doesn't. She's just really good at faking no, it. She, she does. She Here knows ships. <laughs> like all yeah. these realms that I feel like, wow, how much does this person know? You know, and it feels like these are very well researched as well. Uh, probably drawing from her own real life experience. But uh, if there's any realm that she doesn't know, she's I, I, I'm sure she goes and does her homework. So uh, just it's it's a very convincing world that she's built because of that. And those those moments where there's that attention to detail. That's one of those techniques that, you know, Wurtz obviously employs to great effect to convince us of the authenticity of the story. That those moments where the sheets on a, on a ship are given the right name. They're not just called ropes. Where the seals are correctly named. Where they don't make a joke about the poop deck. That, which we know that Philip would have done. There would have been a poop deck joke in there somewhere. Hey, but I have ships in my books with no poop decks. <laughs> Spoiler, Spoiler for the third book in the Idan trilogy, there's no poop deck joke. Um, <laughs> the, the care given to horses, how horses are being used, the, the, how you actually have to look after horses in the wild, that they're not just magical taxis. That all of those things give an air of realism when we, we talk about that. And so that's why we generally talk about authenticity, verisimilitude, rather than realism. 
because it's in this world that is different to ours, that has magic, that has these strange things. And so there's this flexibility, but it gets grounded in those details, gets grounded in that verisimilitudinous reality that convinces us, no, this is happening. And it, they're not deployed ad nauseum. They're, it's not constant repetition of technical detail after technical detail, which I know some people can um, get annoyed at, say, Moby Dick for. Mm. Um, but it's just enough to give this veneer of specific detail that makes the world more realized. And because of that, it if you internally visualize or if you're just caught up in, in detail, it it is a technique that convinces us of the solidity and physicality of this world. Mm, that's a really interesting way to put it. Uh, I know for my brain, I've said this before, I feel like when I'm reading her prose, for me, it kind of helps to just not overthink it <laughs> and to just kind of turn on the visual point of my brain and try to just allow it to unfold visually for me. When I try to break it down technically, that's where I find I'm having to reread sentences and trying to understand things a little more formally, but then I can go back and appreciate some of those things too. And I've noticed like on a technical level, some of the, some things she does, like, for example, there's this wonderful passage at the beginning of Ships of Marrier where we have this uh, bard character and the way he's being described by the other character, I think, is that it describes his skin as like a, a bronze patina with spider web wrinkles. So the way she describes that with such powerful imagery, I could just see it unfold. And then from there, she takes the description and adds emotion to it. These sky blue eyes that are bright and like there's an emotion to the way she describes his eyes. And I think it's beautiful. She sets up the visual and then she supports it with the emotional language that mm -hmm. draws you into um, a more connect, like emotionally connected place. So, I, I mean, I just noticed little things like that that I really appreciated. That's a great observation, and that is part of why I think she succeeds in getting you to feel connected to her characters. Like that's how they're on. You're describing, and I'm seeing him in my head as you're mm -hmm. as you're describing the description uh, and the master bard. You know, yeah. And there's so much emotion uh, that you're so right. There's so much emotion that goes along with that. Um, it's a it's a skill. And yeah. one of the the great things, particularly with that point that you've just made, Joanna, is if you think of how Halloran's eyes are described and then Lys Lysair's eyes are described, because they're, they're both blue. Yeah. Yes, that's true. Yeah. But the emotion conveyed and the images and similes and metaphors used for Lysair's eyes are different. Even yeah. though they're, they're both meant to be this piercing blue, this deep blue, this arresting yeah. blue, the feeling that you get from when Aleron is looking at something and when Lyser is looking at something, you go, they feel very, very different. And yet it, it's a lot of the same, uh, the same words that we associate if you were describing someone's eyes. Oh, sapphire blue as a description of eyes. But how it's conveyed, what works does with it, makes Lyser's eyes quite often colder. Mm -hmm and sharper and harder and you start to notice a connection between a lot of the descriptors used that is building over time to give you the perception of character just mm -hmm. through the color of their eyes and her wonderful use of clothing and uh, the accoutrement that each character possesses that they are reflective of character and scene and tell you something about it and about how they are projecting themselves into the world but also about how the world perceives them that there's such interrelated connectivity between all of these different facets it's not just oh well he was wearing a fancy outfit you go why is Lyser wearing that outfit what is he consciously or unconsciously conveying to all those people around him is this the type of character who would do X or Y. And so much of that is wrapped up in these seemingly straightforward details yeah. that are you know, just meant to be, oh, well, it's just description. No, but it's description with purpose. 
And that's why when I was talking about the style, why I enjoy it so much is that so much is implied by what we are being told. And yeah, you can glide by on the surface and go, oh, Lysera is wearing a, a fancy outfit. Or you can actually think about how it positions him, how he is dressed in relation to other people and how they're described, how are they perceiving him and start to unpick all of those different relationships. And that's, that's one of the things that I love. I loved that too. I actually noticed that too. I made a note about that, like how it was things, certain way, details that she offered as far as like what Lysir was wearing. And then in a next scene, what Arathon was wearing, how they contrasted one another and were saying different things about their characters. I feel like there were just some really interesting, intricate details with her descriptions of that. Yeah, and so often there's a very public purpose to a character's appearance, particularly in Lysair's case, where it's funny how he keeps accusing his half-brother, Arathon, of being such a manipulator, but... Lysera is really quite conscious all the time of the impact he's having on his audience. And it is an audience in his case. Like that scene where he he has arrived at Avenor and uh, he's doing the rebuilding and everything. And he sees that uh, from the distance that uh, somebody from Erdane uh, soldiers have brought these prisoners, clansmen prisoners, in chains and they intend to make slaves out of them. And Lysair, I think some, his reaction is genuine in a sense. He gets very upset and he runs and <laughs> he ends up all muddy and everything. And he arrives in the scene breathless and says, Tip, put me in chains too. And, you know, he's like, oh, this whole spiel about, I will not have anyone, you know, uh, made a slave in my kingdom and on and on and on. And we're getting this, well, maybe he's not such a bad fella after all, you know, he cares about people. And then later in private, when he's talking to his uh, right-hand man there, uh, what's his name? Uh, uh, what's his name? Uh, his right-hand man, Deegan. 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 Mm -hmm. Talking to Deegan. Uh, and he's like, don't worry, Deegan. Uh, I've sent some of the headhunters after them. They have no weapons. They're tired. They're basically dead, you know? So it, it was like he gave this impression. He freed them magnanimously. And, and the whole time it was this, performance i think to a large degree um what did you guys read that as a performance on his part yeah um i think so yeah i mean there were a couple of scenes like that where he there was like one scene where he's strips off his shirt and he runs across and <laughs> i don't know it just felt very performative but right at the same time there were things about lysir that that did make me question um what a villain, if he really is the villain that we're making him out to be too? Uh, I don't know. I'm kind of reserving some judgment of him. I know everybody hates him, but <laughs> I'm reserving some judgment of him. What, one of the things that I find fascinating is, uh, obviously in the very, very first book, in Curse of the Mystery, we're, t we're given the frame narrative, the framing of this whole story, which is this is the unknown history from the point of view of Arathon. And so all the way through this, I've had basically like almost like half an eye looking for if this is Arathon's version of the story, why is Lysair being, um, being described in this way? And how would someone else, if they were on Lysair's side, how would they see it? And there's this duality because of the narrative perspective siding with Arathon that a lot of the those characteristics about Lysair that you go, oh, he, he's a villain. He's not. He's the bad guy. He's doing all of these horrible things. But if you root yourself in his position and think about if Lysair was telling the story, we hear Lysair's side of the story. We just discount it a lot of the time because the narrative is resting on Arathon's side. But Lysair's side of the story, it's not that he lies to people. It's not that he's being untrue it's he is trying to pursue what he sees as justice but because of the curse because of this justice not having any limitations placed on it not having any compromise placed on it not having any compassion integrated into it it is the harshest most possible form of justice and we see how 
he becomes rigid in his interpretation of events. We see almost this sort of radicalization of a position. And you, it makes sense. Oh, the, uh, the tribes people were raiding. And here I am. I'm regal. I'm destined to rule this land. This is my, my birthright. I am a just person and I will seek justice for people. Oh, you can't make them into slaves. But yeah, they, they were stealing. They were raiders. They do need to be punished and they will be punished severely. But we're not going to take away their freedom. That, that's a step too far. That's the line in the sand. You can see this negotiation each time of trying to find a level of natural justice. But his perception of reality is so skewed. Right. It is destroying him. So it's not so much that he is the villain. I keep see, keep coming back to this idea that the curse is the villain and it is corrupting and destroying a good man because we see that he cares about people. We see that he wants to do the right thing. We see that he is doing his best for this. But his view is so twisted by the curse that he doesn't realize the damage he is doing. He is just as much a victim. And because the balance, this weight of the narrative, Arathon is on the side of good, we automatically think, oh, well, Lysir is bad. And we keep forgetting Lysir is a victim here. And we are watching the destruction of someone good and noble and who was trying to do the right thing. This. His story is a tragedy. That's a good way to put it. And actually, there were several parts of this book where I I kind of wrote a side note to myself, like, wow, he really, really believes that he's doing the right thing. Like, he's so convinced of it. Um, and he's, he even, like, his branding of justice is sometimes, even though, like you said, Philip at times may be performative, it is under the, the impression anyway that, these people were wronged, that what Arathon did was wrong, that he harmed people, that he was dis destructive. Um, so I, I think, and there was actually a moment too, where he said that he felt um, burdened by the fact that he had to kill his, that he felt compelled to kill his own half brother, that it was on his conscience. Yeah. Uh, and think Maybe he was confessing that to, um, what was her name? Uh, his his fiance, uh, whom he oh, marries. Taylor. Taylor. Is it Taylor? Taylor. Yeah. T mm -hmm. Talith, Taylor. Yeah. Talith, maybe. Yeah. That's the scene you were talking about. Where he, yes. Yeah. Yes, that's it. That's the scene. Yeah. 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 No, it's interesting. I think because I agree with everything you both said, and I liked Lyser in the first book. I, I actually thought in Curse of the Mistwraith that he was seemed like a you know he had his moments. He was a decent fellow, and they had a rapport going with Arathon at moments. And then the curse happened, which wasn't even his fault. They were both being manipulated by the Fellowship of the Seven, and who seemed like a bunch of bumblers in a way. <laughs> we have to talk about them. I, there's some interesting stuff revealed about them in here and the Coria thing. Speaking of ambiguity, but but. Why, one thing I do wonder is, before we talk about them, uh, why is Lysair less self-aware than Arathon? Because Arathon knows he's been cursed. He's aware of it. He knows that if he's put in front of Lysair, he won't be able to resist the curse. But he actively resists the pull. He does things to, maybe he's just more clever than Lysair. Maybe he got less of the brunt of it than Lysair, because Lysair did get it first and then it was it was sort of uh, uh, given to him, uh, to Arathon when I believe when Lysair struck him with uh, the light right um, in the first book uh, so it, the curse was passed on to Arathon from Lysair not directly from the misery I don't know but it, it does seem obvious that Lysair is much less self-aware right than, he doesn't than know he doesn't know about the Gios he doesn't know about the Gios that causes them to hate each other or that causes them to want to to, um, right, to kill right. each other. And Arathon knows about it, but Lysir doesn't. And at the end, Arathon tries to send that messenger to let him know. And he tells him, he tells him that captain of that ship, he says, you are under um, a geos or a curse to want to, to be compelled to kill your brother. And I think that Lysir doesn't really believe it because he doesn't believe anything coming from Arathon. But yeah, I think that Lysir's in the dark. He doesn't know. Well, here, here's an interesting point 
Have you ever heard the expression, justice is blind? <laughs> Le Lysere is, his notions of justice are blinding him to everything else. Whereas when we think of Arathon, his gift, his ancestral gift is empathy, where you have to see from multiple positions. Mm -hmm. You have to be able to see from the other side of the aisle. You have to be able to understand positions outside of yourself. But Lysere, justice is blind, that his sense of a simplistic right and wrong means that he ignores all of the contradictory evidence. Because to admit that he is being manipulated by the curse, that he is performing things that are unjust, would unmake him. That, that would unravel the very core of who he is, because this is an inherited magical lineage. And if he has been acting unjustly, he is acting contrary to his nature. He must act according to his nature. Therefore, what he is doing is just. And he rationalizes everything to fit with that because everything else is unthinkable. Um, by the way, Joanna, the, the word you just used to describe that curse, that's um, a Celtic word. It's an Irish word. Is it really? I didn't know yeah. that. And I, I am not going to correct your pronunciation. Because... Oh. <laughs> <All right. laughs> no, no, no. And please let me explain this. Um, that's not how you would pronounce it in Irish. But uh, even though it is not a word accepted in English, there's, a, there's an Irish pronunciation associated with it. I, it was a very sorry lesson that I had to learn. When someone learns a word through reading, it is better to celebrate that knowledge that they have learned a new word, they're, they're building up the vocabulary. And in time, they will discover how they want to pronounce it and, and do those sorts of things. But the reason I love that word so much is it's, it's, one of, it's a Celtic word that's been included into this. And for me, seeing things like that always makes me happy because you have so many people going, oh, uh, the English is either Anglo-Saxon, that sort of Germanic root, or it's Latinate. You go, no, there are other languages of, uh, involved in English, in the construction of modern English. And I like uh, seeing Celtic words work their way in. And this one in particular, it is uh, a rare word, even within fantasy, for people to use. Frequently, they will use curse because it is a, just an easier word. But um, the reason that I, I, I probably had the wrong idea of that word is because there's an anime called Code Geass. And I thought that was how you pronounce the anime, but maybe that's even wrong that I watched years ago. You and I thought very, I heard people you very far off. I think the S is, is <laughs> it's pronounced like an SH. Um, so it, it's more like Gesh. 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 Okay. Yeah. Gesh. Uh, but, and again, but yeah, we're good to know. I appreciate it. And it's probably in her glossary. So. <laughs> Uh, and, but the, the thing is, there are so many different uh, dialects of Irish. You go, and there's so many different accents. Yeah, you, you use whatever you want. They, they, it's not a big deal. It's just, it's such a wonderful word. And yeah. it's so rare that I get to see Irish in things. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting point about these two. And uh, my other point was about the ambiguity in here is is wonderful. I'm, I'm enjoying the fact that I haven't made up my mind about several aspects of this world. And I don't entirely trust the Fellowship of the Seven. I know now that they came from another world, that this is uh, almost like getting, is, is Jenny Wirtz going to get all science fiction on us here? Or are we going to do That's something? That's what it seems stuff? like, yeah. yeah. We have some allusions to space travel and stuff. Yes. And, and so like, are the, are the Fellowship human and if they are then they're incredibly long-lived and um using some means to i mean they're i would say that if they were human at one time they're much more than human now um but but they've come from somewhere else and they've they seemingly benevolent i don't i'm not questioning their intentions of benevolence and mm -hmm. creating this harbor for humanity away from 
technology because we see how they try to repress the use of, of gunpowder and, and such because they, mm -hmm. they know where that's going. In other words, that's our world, right? I mean, <laughs> where we get more and bigger and bigger weapons of mass destruction and, and that results in all kinds of atrocities So uh, because humans aren't very good at controlling themselves. So yeah, they've come from somewhere and I believe that their intentions are benevolent. However, they keep messing up things <laughs> And they keep leaving people to suffer consequences. Like they, they let Arathon take the blame for the raid in Aelstron, uh to destroy the mm -hmm. gunpowder. Um, even though they can erase people's memories and stuff like that, they, they just say, well, somebody's got to be blamed. Oops, sorry, Arathon. Um, you know, and <laughs> that's going to have consequences because the Coria thing have basically unleashed the, uh, the, the, the captain who got uh, whipped is, is, is he's kind of a, a loose cannon here. We don't, you know, he hasn't, we haven't just seen what he ends up doing in the first half of this, but I feel like he's going to do some damage at some point. Um, Muriel has basically given him the information that here's where you're going to find Arathon. Go get your vengeance, boy. Um, so, but are the Coriathane evil? I mean, they're presented on a superficial level as evil. They but don't we think get, they are. We get actually quite a bit of information here that their order was founded in order to alleviate suffering and that they believe they're the good guys and that it's the Fellowship of the Seven who are the interfering. And they stole their jewel too. By, you the, know, stone. the Waystone. Yeah, the Waystone, the mm Waystone, -hmm. which would let them have their powers back. So there's a lot of, I'm, I'm enjoying the ambiguity of all of this. In other words, there's no clear good guy, bad guy thing going on here, I think. I, I think there's, there's a lot of acknowledgement that depending on where you stand, that we justify our actions. We rationalize our actions as being good. And we see this in effect. The, the Fellowship of the Seven, they have a, a very long view of the world. And because of that, you, you can understand their distance from everyday people, for even individuals, that they're, they're distant because they've been around for a long time. And I, I'm fairly sure it's been stated that in Curse of the Mystery that Arathon had said that their goal is to bring back the Peruvians. Yeah, that's stated if, here too, yeah. And if that is their goal, their goal isn't to make life better for humans. So why, why do we associate, oh, well, people doing good things for us, that, that means that they're good. And if they're doing something for someone else, oh, well, you know, then they're not good. Their goal is not to improve life for humans. It's to bring back the Peruvians. Um, and so I don't necessarily see it, it's It's morally neutral, that position, because it's, it's not about doing bad things. But clearly, they manipulate people. They use people. Things that we would regard as, you know, bordering at least on the um, the, the the darker side of the spectrum. <laughs> but at the same time, it's for this greater good because we've seen the beauty of the sun children and the centaurs and the unicorns, how beautiful and wonderful and magical they were and how this world has lost part of its essence because they are not present. And so you can understand their drive to do this, to maintain a balance, this balance that was obviously important to the Peruvians. And humans getting technology, we know the repercussions of this. The fact that gunpowder, the very first, well, it's gunpowder for a start, it, it's already a weapon. People weren't using this to make fireworks a la Gandalf in The Lord of the Rings. They were using it to make weapons. And that leads to an escalation. As more and more people get weapons, they become more and more destructive. We know what that cycle of violence leads to. And so in a world where these figures have the power to alter that, we see that they are trying to have the world live in balance to support humanity, but not have humanity destroy the world. That a balance is trying to be achieved here. And everything that they, they do seems to be about that balance. And even their magic, when they talk about it, they talk about the balance that must be maintained. 
And so I think there's a lot to that. It's not necessarily a, a question of good and evil. It's a question of where you stand and your perception of the end goal. And what does it take to achieve that? Lysir does not see himself as evil. His, his means that he employs, he sees as entirely justified. And it's interesting because Arathon doesn't think of himself as good. <laughs> Just want to add that in. Sorry, you weren't finished. And, and, and that's, again, the point, uh, precisely the point. Arathon is, is sitting there and he's going, well, I don't want to fight him. And you're, But if you killed Lysir, all of this would end. The, the entire war would be over because it, you wouldn't perpetrate it. Arathon could come back and be crowned the rightful heir of these lands. He could unite the clans people. He could broker peace between the clans people and the towns people, regardless of which kingdom that they are in. Arathon could do all of that if someone just killed Lysir. But he won't. He won't do it. He won't take the one single life that would end all of this conflict. Yeah. And when when you look at the cost of lives mounting up in Curse of the Mistress, all of those clans people who died, all of them, mm -hmm. in this book, again, more and more people dying, all because he won't kill Lysair. Mm -hmm. Well, easier said than done, too, I suppose, right? I mean, for him to kill Lysair is... First, he has to have the will, as you say, but also there's a logistical issue. He's surrounded by a massive army at this point, and uh, he has seemingly, at least on, uh, on, on paper, the power on his side uh, because he has the – really, I mean, Lysair has the, uh, the towns of, of, uh, of Arathon's very own kingdom, uh, Rathane, solidly behind him. And he's won over the townspeople of his own kingdom at this point. And uh, it's the clans people who are the marginalized people who are siding on Arathon's side, which is another reason why we automatically tend to side with Arathon because he's the underdog here, right? Um, so I find that very interesting too. But, well, it's, yeah. it's interesting too what you were saying about, um, about humans because given some of what we learned in this book, um, I mean, I'm getting the impression that humans aren't natural to this world. No. They're not from this world. No. So restoring the major balance towards the world, you know, usually we're so human centric with the way we think of the world. And in this world, maybe that's not the goal. You know, maybe that makes sense in a way, at least from the fellowship's point of view. But I do question all of it too, like you said, Philip, and like what you were saying about the Koryani, because they did talk, the prime talked about using the waystone or getting rid of disease, that kind of thing. I don't know. Yeah, and she's, you know, at certain points, as she's looking at her successor, Lorenda, mm -hmm. and thinking one thing she lacks is compassion, but we also have to be tough in order to survive in this environment that we're in. So you, you see them also, I think, in a, in a slightly more fleshed out, light in, in, in Ships of Marrier than, than what we got initially. Uh, and of course, we do have to talk about Elyra uh, um, yes. uh, in a big way. I love Elyra. I love that character so much. Um, I just enjoyed her on the page. I enjoyed actually all the female characters quite a bit in this story. Captain um, Durkin, yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. And I actually enjoyed Talith too, Talith, however you say her name. Yeah, um, yeah, there were just some really and Manel, Manel. Oh my <laughs> I goodness! I have the pronunciation, so I apologize. And I know Jenny very kindly has a pronunciation guide. Back. So yeah, I I really enjoyed some of those. Like the showdown between Manel and Lysir at the end Ooh. was one of my favorite parts in the whole entire book. Like where she was banking on his image of honor. You were talking about how he's very performative, and he basically tells he tells her something along the lines. He says. Uh, See. Hmm. He yeah. says, he snaps at her, better I be forsworn as a man than the justice of this realm become debased. No affectation of courtesy will mitigate the punishment to do for your act. Who am I to uphold my personal honor before the protection of my townsfolk? So he would, I think I got the impression like his image of honor was not as important to him as justice <laughs> or how he perceived justice to be. 
So I think that was interesting just because we were talking earlier about his image. Sorry, I'm digressing on a separate point. That's good. No, I, I, it all adds to, to this about the perspective. And he's, he's there. He knows that she gave all, all those goods that she stole from him. She's a thief. She stole these goods. And she gave them to his enemy. That's the key thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't matter if uh, the if it had been in tribute for something else, if there is an honorable reason behind it, or if there, you aided the enemy, therefore you need to be punished. But this person didn't break that thing. They were abiding by this tradition. They've done this thing. They've come to you, and it. We see how he blinds himself to what is honorable, what is good, what should be just in this situation. He blinds himself to all of that because he has to justify punishing her. Yeah. And I, I again, I keep coming back to this idea that Lysera is so tragic in this construction that we see a good man being hollowed out by... A, a curse that we see that his natural inclinations are at war with what he is perpetrating and everything becomes performative. We see the separation between him and everyone else, that every outfit he wears is a costume. It's not really him anymore. It's mm -hmm. he is playing a role and he is losing himself. Whereas with Arathon, we see his, he's almost tortured um, in combination with being a master bard with his compassion and empathy that he is being tortured and losing himself to the needs of everyone around him. Mm. Lysera has the opposite that yeah. he is losing himself because he is being directed in this one tiny facet and there isn't anything behind it anymore. I want to bring up a quote. This was one of those like popular highlighted quotes on my Kindle version um, that Arathon tells to Alara, and it says, to live for approval of others was a pitfall that begged a false turning. Mm -hmm. Interesting to highlight that. He was telling her that. Especially in the context of how she's been sent deliberately to ensnare him. Uh, and the mm -hmm. whole layers of that situation that they're in where she loves him and she's been sent to seduce him in order to undermine him. And she can't really say anything about any of it. And he loves her, but can't say anything. And ultimately the scene when they heal the, the young sailor, by the way, one of the most beautiful scenes I've ever seen. Uh, in, in Which literature. part? I'm sorry. The scene where they heal the, uh, the young uh, sailor. Yes. Uh, the, the surgery, the magical surgery. Yes. The magical surgery where she's doing her magic. He's doing his lyranth playing and master bard thing and supporting her and, it's a beautiful scene. I mean, it's just gorgeous. How they, become, they become one person in that uh, intention of healing too. And, and, yes. and it's really wonderful, benevolent uh, act. And it strips away all the deceptions at the same time, because they really know what the other is thinking. And then yes. he brings her back to her, her, her place and collapses seemingly. And there's that intimacy that's, um, just so well done um, and and painful at the same time because ultimately he leaves because he knows that, or he thinks that he doesn't know she's been given permission to have a, a little uh, thing, a fling or whatever with him. <laughs> so he thinks if, if she has a relationship with him, it's going to end up killing her. Um, and that's why he, he leaves. Right. I mean, he, he, it's a sacrifice on his part to say, no, I can't let you do this because I know it would, it, here's the vow. He recites the vow she swore as a member of the Coria thing. So, but what a gorgeous scene. I, I just well, love that part. Side note, I love the way Jenny Wirtz writes about romance. I just love it. I just and music, it. yeah. And music, yeah. But yeah. that intimacy between them was so, ah, oh, that was so beautiful. Yeah. Um, especially because they both, one, she doesn't know that he really loves her that he's really loved her and he doesn't know that she really loves him. And she, he doesn't know that she's from his point of view, she's just there because of the Coriandi. And then he finally sees through that. And they have this moment where they clearly see each other and they have that moment of oneness. And like you said, he felt like he couldn't be with her. And I think there was some, 
if I felt like there was a line kind of foreshadowing that it is possible for her to have children uh, further down the line or that he can have children further down the line mm. and that they wouldn't, that that would be allowed given the fact that in book one, they touched, he and Lysera touched that well, Davian's well, I think is what it's called. That gave them the long lifespan. Right. And of course, uh, Lorenda is given a long lifespan in this book. But they, I felt like there was some kind of foreshadowing that they could possibly have children further down. <laughs> now, whether that happens, I have no idea. But well, there is a prophecy by Dakar, I believe, too, isn't there? Oh, uh, is there? I can't remember. I think there's something to do with the Fellowship of the Seven, and that's why Luhane comes and gives her a more benevolent long life, as mm -hmm. whereas what she was given by her own order was uh, slightly like it, it was the the rough version, I guess. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, one of the ways that I kind of thought about it was the difference between eternal youth and eternal life. Yeah, and if I, you remember that old, uh, the, the classical story where the king wishes for eternal life and he just ages and cannot yeah. die and gets older and older and older. And no we reason. see that with the Korean the that they get the eldest of them, their matriarch, is she is twisted and bitter and in pain. Because, yes, it has extended her life, but not extended her youth. Whereas we look at the seven and how they have gone about it is, again, this uh, something that seems more in tune with the balance of the universe. And because of that, they continue to exist almost at the same point that they are arrested in time. So it's it, it's an interesting development. And I, I'd like I'm really fascinated to see how it, it is going to be explored further. But that. Just how Johnny, or sorry, how Wurtz uses music um, in a number of the different sequences was so wonderful to read. And in particular, I believe it was um, Jared on the, the fantasy thinker had a, a passage that he had gone through. And it's the scene where Halloran is playing for the nobles. Uh, I watched that. Yeah, it was great. Mm -hmm. And in this sequence, it begins with uh, Halloran playing rhythmically and in the passage of writing Wurtz employs a lot of uh, alliteration mm -hmm. a lot of accents a lot of repetitive phrasing uh, or to stress and unstress the rhythm of the language of the words on the page reflects what Halloran is actually doing whereas when when we move if you look at the previous paragraphs or the paragraphs afterwards that alliteration and assonance and consonants, all, all those things are missing, that they're not there. They were deliberately put there to reflect the rhythmic nature of his playing. And it, it's little moments like that where the prose is not just describing, but is matching the action on the page. Mm -hmm. mm, yes, I love that particular scene. It's so, uh, it's an incredibly rich scene. And I loved Jared's video of that too, of that passage. Um, and he did talk quite a bit about the alliteration and, I love how you mentioned the rhythm too. That was something my mother noticed too. She said, oh, she has excellent rhythm in her prose. Like that was mm -hmm. something that stuck out to her right away. Um, I thought it was interesting kind of going to that location to Jaylet. Did you all notice in, especially the courtroom scene there? I felt, I feel like, um, I wanna see if I'm, if you two have the same impression. I feel like whenever we are, because one thing I love about Jenny's prose specifically is are her descriptions of nature and music. And when the two come together, it's my favorite type of writing ever. And, but one thing I noticed is that when we're in more civilized places with the townspeople, like I suppose, like in Jaylet, I felt like her writing was, it was very like flamboyantly colorful. Like it felt almost like it was touching on the absurdity of the culture there, like mm -hmm. in, the, in the court scene. And I wondered if you two, Notice that too, like the way they were rolling out the carpets and the way the jury was. I feel like I was almost watching a Muppet show in a way. I don't know. <laughs> it just got so crazy. Yeah, talk about performative. I mean, they were going. It was it was over the top and it was ridiculous. And of course, the reader is, I think, in on the joke that yeah. these people are taking themselves way too seriously here. Yeah, um, I felt like it was deliberate. I'll just put it that way. I felt like this was all very deliberate on her part. Yeah, to kind of highlight the, the um, I don't know, just the audacity of the civilization and 
kind of mocking it a little bit on the reader's side. Like it's almost humorous. I think. Hypocrisy, all those things, the greed, uh, the arrogance, all of it is very much rolled up in all that great description. And of course, who, who put, makes all this happen is that idiot Dakar, <laughs> who oh, I, I can't tell you how many times I got so annoyed with him. Well, Dakar. before we get started on, on Dakar, would you mind terribly if I take a short break here? Or yeah, you, can carry on, you can carry on without me, but I'll be back in a couple of minutes. Sure, go ahead. Yeah, I, I, I will be, express my annoyance at Dakar while... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he annoyed me too. <laughs> yeah, oh, Dakar. I mean, this book gave me some characters to cheer for in like Captain Durkin. I loved, I uh, thought that she was a great character and I love how she was cursing and and how ultimately she was convinced by Arathon to go along and help and and uh, and that he knew what to appeal to. And beneath her her piratical ways, there is a sense of honor and and uh, loyalty, and and so I just loved getting to know her a bit there. I hope she's she is a come a character who will come back in future books. Uh, but Dakar, oh my goodness, Dakar, uh, <laughs> he's I I'm not sure which what annoys me the most about him, <laughs> his constant bumbling or the fact that he is continuously undermining Arathon, who just keeps, who knows that Dakar is going to do it. And so he uses that in each scenario um, to, to his own advantage. Um, like when they, he, he uses Dakar's betrayal to get into the armory um, that he's supposed to take stock of. And that doesn't go very well. And, and but yeah, I mean, I don't know. Dakar is supposed to be working for the Fellowship of the Seven, and yet he continuously disobeys orders, tries to get out of things. He's even, Asandir even gives him the, uh, uh, basically, uh, a, a curse or whatever, um, and says, yeah, if, if you don't stick by Arathon, you're, you're, you're going to hate everything. You're not going to be able to taste food anymore. You can take no pleasure in anything. And he still tries to weasel his way out, right? And so, yeah, I mean, it just, uh, he, he's good for some some comedy, I guess, here and there. But why did the Fellowship put up with this guy is what I want to know. Why do they keep him around? Is it just because once in a while he spews out a prophecy? I think that's it. <laughs> that's the only thing I can think of. Now, I understand that he's operating on some misconceptions of Arathon from book one. Right. And he thinks he is part of, like, what caused all the destruction to the clans people. And he was friends with Lysir in book one, too. Uh, so he's struggling with that as well. But, yeah, he was annoying. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> one of the things that I, I enjoy about Dakar as a character is how so many of his, his points of view, his perception of things, initially mirrored the reader's experience. Because when you look at Arathon and Lysir in, in The Curse of the Mystery, when you see the two of them together, who is the one that is charming and easygoing and is good looking and is always there with a, with a joke and looks the part of being noble and good? That's all Lyser. And that's part of the attraction of him as a character. He looks the part. He sounds the part. He's really good at putting people at ease, at telling them what they want to hear. He's a consummate politician. But Arathon, on the other hand, is quite cold and closed off and is sharp in his retorts. And it's only because we as reader understand how painful he finds the interactions with other people because of his gift, because he is constantly seeing and feeling their point of view. And he can't turn that off. He has developed defenses against it. He's, he's holding himself back, which makes him feel slightly untrustworthy. This guy is sharing everything with us and you, you're just secretive and you, you're always mean and nasty and pushing people away. And we can understand that reaction. And when you think then of their gifts and how we, we perceive, oh, Lysair can create light and light is on the side of good. Whereas Arathon, oh, he creates shadow and shadow is darkness and evil and manipulative and when they're just elemental powers. 
but we cast them with this morality. And Dakar, we can understand his perspective then, why he liked Lysair so much, why he enjoyed his company so much, why he gave his allegiance over to Lysair. And when he sees Lysair being used by the Seven, he blames them and wants to protect Lysair. He doesn't want to protect Arathon because the Seven protected Arathon. Mm. But the Seven used Arathon to just the same extent. Yeah. And it again, I think, us multiple times. <laughs> I, and so I, I think a lot of Dakar is giving voice to the struggles or the, the contradictions and problems that we as reader experience in trying to parse out who these characters are against what we want to think, against what we now think. Um, the more knowledge we have of each of them, it deepens our understanding until it, it feels like we hate Lysair. Lysair is evil because we're falling into the same trap again that we did at the very beginning. It's... And so how Wurtz plays with that perception, uses Dakar as a way to give voice to our criticisms and our questions and our perception of the world, and uses that just as a, a way to give the reader a, a hand in understanding these things. I, I greatly enjoy that. I like that. I like how you talked about his narrative purpose in that regard. And that's really neat. Um, I... Also want to mention Nico from Nico's Book Reviews did a video, the, I think just yesterday, actually. And he was talking about this particular series and how um, just about free will in this series mm -hmm. and how these characters are really operating from a lack of free will or a lack of agency. But at the same time, Jenny Wirtz very skillfully employs boundaries around that. So we have like two opposing forces, right? We have the curse that is causing them uh, to want to kill each other. And then we have their separate curses where Lysera is cursed to think only in terms of justice and Erathon and only in terms of compassion. So they have, and these two things oppose each other, especially in Erathon's perspective, right? If he's driven towards compassion and still wants to kill his brother. And yet the ways around it is he learns, and we see this, at, especially at the end of the story, how he employs these, these certain boundaries. And like you were saying that with Dakar, that's what brought this made, made this come to mind for me. Um, EP, how Dakar doesn't really understand Erathon and why Erathon's doing what he's doing. But in a way, what he's doing is finding ways, finding ways to work around these, these uh, challenges to his own agency. He's creating these boundaries around it. So like he creates the, the wire that wraps around or he has the wire wrapped around him at the end, for example, to keep him from going crazy. So I think that it's really interesting to just look at those different perspectives on, and I like how you said that Dakar is used to kind of give us that insight. Yeah. In fact, he does go crazy, but he knew he was going to. So he, he knew he was going to. Yeah. Even then, uh, poor, uh, oh gosh, what's his name? Uh, I know. Uh, uh, Jarrett? Jarrett. Jarrett. Yeah. Jirit is doing everything he can. That's another great relationship in here. I've, I've been very happy with the relationships in here. Uh, there's uh, uh, Arathon and Elaira, and uh, Jirit in Arathon is another great one because of the loyalty he feels from, yes, he's a clansman and, and his, his, he's inherited his father's role now. His father, of course, was killed in the first book uh, in that horrible, horrible uh uh, last couple hundred pages of, of battle that still haunts me. Um, and, uh, and so Jira just was a boy then, um, just a little 12 year old kid or something like that. I think I can't remember exact age, but something like 12 years old. And he uh, feels this incredible loyalty, which is, you know, that's, that's another thing. It's interesting to contrast say Jira's relationship with Arathon and Deegan's relationship with Lysair. Mm -hmm. Here you have two uh, kind of lieutenants, if you will, who are intensely loyal and clearly love their 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 lord. Um, and we feel, I, I at least I feel, this complete unabashed admiration of the relationship between Jirit and Arathon, whereas the relationship between Deegan and Lysair feels somehow more political to me uh, or even mm -hmm. though 
you know, from, from Deegan's perspective, he worships this guy for a reason. He's constantly fighting with him because he, he sees that he's putting himself in danger or, but he, he loves this guy. You know, um, it's, he does it's, argue it's, with him at times, though, too. He does, yeah. Which I appreciate it. Yeah, yeah. I, he's I not actually sycophantic about it. He, he's, he's, but he's extremely loyal. Yeah. yeah, actually, that's something I really appreciated in this particular book is the way that the those relationships that you're talking about, the way the characters who are even on the same side, and of course, Dakar and Arathon is probably the biggest example. But I actually really liked it in like all of the relationships. There was conflict. And not necessarily um, conflict that meant they were going to go against each other, but there was there were conflicting moments. There were conflicting moments between Deegan and Lysir. There were conflicting moments between Durkin and Arathon. She even when she came around, she was still challenging him. Yeah, she, yeah. she was still you know not afraid to to argue with him. And I really I think that that added for me that added to I always gonna I'm always gonna mispronounce the word verisimilitude. <laughs> to this story trying to use that well Joy, i think that is an absolutely brilliant point because uh one of the things that we typically see so often in a story is where the the story kind of shapes what character actions are as oh look the quest group has formed and they've all agreed on this outcome and they're all going to do the thing and they're all going to work together and oh isn't this great whereas i don't know if you've ever had the opportunity to work as part of a team but one person will have an idea and you go, no, no, that idea is not going to work. We're going to go with it. And they'll push back against it because they have their vision of where, of how to do the thing. And then someone else will go, right, well, but if we tweak it this way, everyone still has their own, their own input, their own desire, their own psychology, their own way of viewing the outcome. So even though your goals may be aligned, you still have very different perspectives and you have different approaches to it and you will disagree on it. And highlighting that, the way that you did about the inherent conflict between characters, even when they are on the same side, mm -hmm. when their goals and what they want to do aligns, is, is one of those things that is so real because people don't lose sight of their own personal goals just because they've agreed to a group project. And seeing that here is is one of those great joys it's not melodrama it's not oh look at the drama between these characters it's a real life okay we have to do this thing but i'm not going to help I, like i just can't be bothered you go and do that like in trying to get rid of the black powder the car knows that he has to do it because he has been told by the but he's like but i don't have to do it personally if arathon does it that still counts as me doing it because it's you know as long as it gets done and we see that Arathon, knowing that the car is going to betray him, factors that in to how he's going to accomplish the thing. But because the car betrayed him, he didn't know what was in the barrels that had to be destroyed, which almost leads to everyone getting blown up. That all of that is this wonderful interplay of people hi deliberately hiding information from the other person or trying to manipulate the other person to get them to do it the way that they want them to do it. Mm. And it's true to each of the characters. Mm. And that's the thing that's so much, so much fun in this. You can see the level of thought that's gone into giving each character their own point of view, their own goals, their own aims, their own personality. It's not just about them being a plot function to further, this is where the story is going. It's no, this character knows that's where the story is going and they're going to fight tooth and nail every part of the way because they don't want to do that. I love um, that. I love that. And I, by the way, I love that, uh, Philip, you were drinking out of your mug there while he's talking. I'm like, because you two are a great example of that. <laughs> <laughs> there is this. no I in teamwork, AP. There is a me, though. <laughs> <laughs> Yay. No, I, I loved that. I loved that, how she, um, how she approached that and all the relationships just about, I mean, there was even a moment between, uh, one of my, another moment I really loved was when, when Arathon got angry at Hal, 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 I can't say his name now. Yes, because yeah. he realized that his mate is, 
not his mage gift, I'm sorry, his music gift was actually perhaps a weapon, which by the way, I feel like I called that in our book one discussion, didn't I? <laughs> so I was like excited about that, but I just, I, I loved how, you know, he, and man, how do you get mad at Halloran? He just seems like the sweetest man, but at the same time, it was understandable too, uh, the consequences. He abandoned his wife and child. But also, okay, so we can talk about Hall we, we can talk about Halloran in his personal capacity. We can right. talk about his calling and how his calling drew him away from something that he loved, his family, because his calling was greater than his own personal satisfaction. That's one way of looking at it. Right. Or if we could, depending if we are Arathon or Lysair, let's say in this conversation, the other side might say he abandoned his wife and child or Halloran's daughter take her perspective yeah to go and uh, indulge his love of music but again depending on where you stand that judgment about his character you know is is a question and you get completely different answers depending on how you view it because we are a bundle of contradictions we we are made up of all of these different decisions that have pros and cons that have consequences. And Halloran in one moment is, you know, this twinkly eyed, gleeful bard who's going to entertain you. In another moment, he is this steely eyed veteran who is going to destroy the very fabric of a society by revealing all of their lies, their deceits, their uh, oh, yeah. clandestine. <laughs> And he's going to drag all of their dirty laundry out in public because he feels that they have slighted him, that they have mistreated him, that they have treated Dakar badly. And you know what? He doesn't like them. So he's going to drag everything out into the light and destroy relationships. Yeah, he was pretty bold in that move, I have to say. And I thought it was interesting, too, because then when Arathon got on stage and started playing his tune, he actually played a tune to get them to understand Halloran through his eyes. And what a sweet man he really was, this wonderful bard. So painting back that picture again. <laughs> so Jenny just kind of keeps throwing us through, throwing different pictures of different characters at us. So like you said in the beginning, Philip, it's just very nuanced uh, character work. Yeah, not only the characters, but I think Wirtz also gets across increasingly what is really a complex society here. Because you have all these kingdoms, not just Rathane and Tysan, but you have Shand and, I don't know, Havish and others and Melhala and all these different kingdoms. And within them, you have these displaced clans people who used to be royalty and were except in this one town in Elstron where they were able to hold on. But interestingly, because of what happened in their armory, they're going to side with, you would think they'd be more inclined to side with uh uh with uh, uh oh gosh there's so many names <laughs> you would think they'd be more inclined to side with arathon but they're gonna side with lycer mm -hmm. and it's interesting because you have all these different um uh, rivalries going on and i assume these kingdoms were probably at each other's throats at different times i have a feeling too that because of what we're getting hints of about the fellowship sorcerers and such this could go beyond this world we've already seen these mm -hmm. other worlds that the series started in was it dash and elor or something like that where arathon and lycer originally were, were from um, and then they were brought to this world uh, so i have a feeling things are going to get uh, even more layered perhaps i have so many questions like i wonder i i wonder about like the different lanes by the way you know the different vibrational lanes and i wonder, um, I, I, don't, I know that there's already like the seven in the fellowship right the number seven but I also wondered about like uh, the notes and music, like seven scale, you know. There are eight lanes, I think, right? Oh, are there eight know. lanes? I thought there were seven. Maybe I got that. No, I think that, that there's an eighth that's been mentioned. Oh, okay. But never mind. It's a full octave then. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Maybe it's a musical thing. Yeah. I think she said eight keys at one point too, which technically there are 12 keys in the circle of fifths, but... In any case, I, I do wonder about that. I love the parallels between music. And I think she's been very clear that there's definitely parallels between vibration as sound, as light, as color, and as emotion. And how mm -hmm. these are all layered together in this world. 
into the physics of the world. So <laughs> I'm really curious how she's going to take it, where the journey she's taking us on with this. Um, uh, well, I also want to bring, oh, sorry, go ahead. Well, I was about to say, you do realize that Philip and I are relying entirely on you to oh, no. explain a lot of this music stuff. You're the music because person, Joanna. You, you're you're the nominated person. music expert who, who will be able to explain all of this to us oh. mere neophytes. I took a physics of acoustics class once and it was well over my head, <laughs> but I'll do my best. Uh, but no, I think she really put a lot of, like, from what I understand, she's actually really developed the metaphysics of this world in a way that could almost be plausible. I don't know. It's very interesting to me. Uh, but I have to say, too, I have to bring up the character that I failed to bring up at the beginning when I was talking about female characters, and that's Jeunesse, the mother of the twin. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Because she's so much of the reason why why the merrier situation happened, right? I mean, that was the reason. Mother of the twins, yeah. He wanted to protect her and the twins. He made an oath to her. Yeah. And I just, I, we were talking again about conflicts between characters or the way that they kind of grapple a little bit here and there, even if they're on the same side. I really loved the scene where he carries her out of her house and forces her on the boat. <laughs> I thought that was fantastic because this is a woman who's really struggling with grief and, you know, becoming a recluse because of her grief and because of her fear of losing her children and what she's already lost. And I think it's, I just thought it was beautiful the way Arathon was really helping her, well, kind of forcibly. <laughs> making her work through that. And I, I, I think it's, it's fascinating that again, oaths given have weight in this world. Yeah. Promises made have weight and there are repercussions, ramifications and consequences because of certain words spoken. Arathon ends up on a course of action he could have avoided. Oh, the, the fact that th this is part and parcel of, of certain fantasy worlds uh, in, in other writing as well. But it's that wonderful thing about, in, in today's society, so much of, um, you see with online discourse, oh yeah, no, but I, I, I just said that and I didn't mean it. Or, you know, I, I shouldn't be held accountable for what I said because it was just words. That in a fantasy world, we can give the words the, the actual weight that they carry. We can literalize the, the metaphor about the power of words. And seeing that in action, understanding it in terms of the ramifications in narrative can lead us to a better understanding of how our words in real life can have consequences and ramifications and cause uh, actions to occur that may not have happened. Yeah. And so I, I like how that plays out. Uh, it's one of these literalized aspects um, made manifest in fantasy that we see occasionally that has that point of connection to our own world but it, it's disguised slightly. Plays a role as well, uh, not only when he tries to protect Marrier for the sake of those twins and their mother, Janess, but also when he is sort of forced to stay in uh, Inish, where Holleron is from, because his widow basically says, all right, you're his apprentice. I'm going to ask you to do this thing and you're going to have to stay here and play in this town because it never got to hear him play. And he's sort of obligated to, to do it. Right. Oh, um, God, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's pretty powerful. Yeah. And so, it's, it's, I, I, oh, sorry. Joel. No, go ahead. Go ahead. But that, that's what I was going to say. A lot of these female characters, although they are not like Sarah and Arathon, the central sort of main focus of the, the narrative. A lot of these female characters are so central and so important to what happens. And mm -hmm. I, I don't think that any of them are treated as caricatures. That we don't mm -hmm. have, oh, well, she's the grief stricken wife of a fisherman and she's a harridan and she's mean. And that's the, she feels more fully rounded, more three dimensional with depth and with the contradictions that we carry within ourselves that she wants to like Arthur, but she also doesn't want to like Arthur because of what he represents and he's going to make things bad for her kids but her kids love him and the the kids are actually learning something useful but that's going to take the kids away you, we see that push and pull within her character each time that she looks at Arthur, and I, I love seeing that played out on the, the page. She isn't treated as a disposable character who is just going to 
and um, fulfill the plot function and be thrown away, just like the the, the sea captain. Yeah. Uh, and she again, like, she keeps she's she's mercenary. Yeah, she makes this deal with Arthur, but she's always looking to better the deal to see what more. And she wants to. She's going to be loyal. She's going to help Arthur out. But what's in it for her? And you can see that um, that byplay that we find in their characters. And this is a joy to this writing that there are very few characters in the series that I have encountered thus far that I think you can just dismiss as throwaway or as caricature or as plot function. There's a lot of thought seems to have gone into each and every character being realized about what their own personal goals and drives are. I, it's, that's a great observation, I, I would say. And I found myself even liking characters that I thought I hated, like the um, the headhunter guy who works for Lysare, who's shot by Jirrit. Uh, what was his name? Oh, oh man. I can't remember. You know what I'm talking I, about. I know who you're talking about, yeah. He's one of the few really capable commanders on Lysare's side, and he knows what he's doing. He's, he's the headhunter he was in the first book and committed some horrible atrocities in the last couple hundred pages of Curse of the Mist Wraith. He did some, ah, oh, Pesquil. Pesquil is his Pesquil. name. Pesquil, oh, that's right. Okay. Oh my goodness, I hated that guy. I hated his guts. And I was kind of like, even like cheering for Jirrit. But then I thought, wow, I, I was a little bit sad even when, when Pesquil died and he was trying his best, his loyal best to help Lysair and it was dying breaths. And I admired some things about him, like the fact that he had no time. Truth, truth that you're the nemesis. You admired the <laughs> genocider. <laughs> Good grief. No. You were waiting for that to happen. <laughs> I admired his uh, loyalty and his... Um, I didn't admire the genocide part, um, but uh, his, you know, he believed he was right too, you know, he, and at the same time, he had a respect for his, his enemies. He, when he was that scene, when my Sarah says, here's the, the arrowhead. And he was reading what, what, uh, yeah. what was on it. It had his name on it and it had all this, you know, this is a vengeance arrow or whatever. He, he understood the custom. He had, there was respect there, even as, bar, as as barbarous as he behaved toward the clans people. There was also some respect there. They understood each other, and he knew you know, what that era was all about. And yeah, he knew that he had killed this young man's family, slaughtered children, and all kinds of stuff. So it was. It's interesting to feel some ambiguity about a character that I thought I just despised um, oh yeah I, th I have a feeling she's gonna keep doing this to us too uh yeah. <laughs> i and i feel that you know bringing it back to lysera again there were moments where i felt i felt for him because it it was clear to me i mean we've already talked about uh, just like what you said ap that he's a tragic character but i especially loved the whole boar hunting scene where it really wasn't about the boar hunting it was about getting alone um but he was also reflecting on his mother and how his mother, I guess, was, mm. uh, well, his grandfather was, you know, taught Arathon about magecraft, right? About wizardry. And that was something he felt jealous about. There's some baggage. Yeah. 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 And it was something that he also uh, just, it seems like he was scared of it. And he thought of it as a true evil. And the townspeople thought of it as an evil. And he was constantly trying to make them feel at ease about uh, that he wasn't doing that. And you know, it just felt to me like maybe he felt abandoned by his mother and yeah. maybe jealous of Arathon. And then I also loved, just slightly separate from that, I also really loved at the end when he felt fooled by the shadow ships, how he was remembering how <laughs> Arathon used those little shadow ships in book one to connect with the children. Yeah. And I felt like there was a moment of jealousy there too. So... A lot of callbacks there that I found interesting. Mm -hmm. in yeah. The uh, relationship with his father, Lysera's relationship with his father. Oh, we saw yeah. in the first book was very fraught, not a good relationship. He, no. he, as a little boy, saw that his father was kind of abusive and mean and, and that the, he was on his mother's side. He loved his mother and his mother left him mm -hmm. and went and had this kid from another father. And every time he calls uh, Arathon a bastard, you know, you, you hear that 
that jealousy that, um, you know, it's, it's, it's part of it, definitely part of it. But he also, I think recognizes how uh, he's becoming his father in some ways too. Mm -hmm. Right. He's I think so. Yeah. Cause there was a, there was a speech that he was recalling that his father told him yeah, about being yeah. a leader and that it seemed to ring true for who he was now, where I, I got the impression we as readers at least were supposed to see that. So. Yep. Uh, and when we think of that, that sequence at the end with the ships coming in and it's, and how, how did Arathon destroy Lysar's fleet? It's, well, I'll shield, I'll have the ship sail at him and then he'll set fire to them. I know mm -hmm. he will because he can't help himself. Mm -hmm. And again, Arathon playing, manipulating his half-brother. When they call him manipulative, they, they're absolutely spot on. Fair but point. Because we have such a pejorative negativity associated with the term manipulation that we see what Arathon is doing and don't necessarily think of it as bad. And we go, well, can you really call him manipulative? Yeah, yeah, you can. That, that is precisely what he does. He plans on understanding how the other person is going to react. And yet Lyser basically is the architect of his own destruction each and every time. Who took, why did he touch the, the mystery in the first place? It's, oh, well, I'll, just, I'll put my finger in the dam. You're an idiot. You don't know what you're doing. Um, well, that but, was the fellowship's doing too, though, I think. Well, the, 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 I blame He made the choice to stick his finger in the theory. <laughs> it's um, like me when I was two and I put my finger in an electric socket. <laughs> oh, gosh. That explains so much. <laughs> um, but Lyser is so often the architect of his own misfortune. But because he is the regal leader, it's, it's oh, well, mistakes were made. It's like, Dude, it was you. Like, you literally made mistakes. Were made. Look at what this man has wrought upon us and look at what we have suffered. It's immediately deflect the blame, deflect the blame onto him, build up the next argument to mount against Arathon. You, we see this all the time in politics. Yeah. Never admit that you made a mistake. Admit that mistakes were made, but it was their fault in the first place and cast the blame right back on them to bolster your own position again. And we have seen... Lyser, as we had with these flashbacks or this information about his past, this is what he was taught from an early age. Manipulate those around you. Show them what a true leader is. Get them to do the things that you need them to do because you're the leader. You make the decisions. So much of that is wrapped up in it. And yet, again, because of this curse, because of his blindness to these other things, we see that he can't accept his own responsibility here. Yeah, what's interesting too is that in recognizing how Arathon has manipulated him at the end there to incinerate all those ships and therefore basically destroy his own fleet, people died in that moment. Mm -hmm. I mean, there were sailors on those ships and he tries to use that as more... To, to whip up people like see he's he's really evil look what he did he killed but then the messenger comes the captain that had been initially abducted and sort of converted to seeing Arathon's not the monster he's been painted out to be that captain brings the message and in that message is also the fact that look Arathon is saying look I could have done this when you were fully loaded with all your soldiers but I didn't and he didn't have to do that too Right. And he wasn't sent by Arathon to do that. Uh, Arathon didn't even try to manipulate that captain, was the impression I got. Right. But at the same time, I really love what you said about, um, I have to add that I really like that we do perceive manipulation as a negative thing. And maybe we're um, invited to see it differently in this book, in this story, in this context. And it, it's the skillful way that Arathon manipulates it, but also Lysir does it as well. Like we see how he manipulates the people in his court, but it's a very stratified organization. Whereas we see Arathon half the time is manipulating people so that he gets out of not being in a stratified. It's, you know, if, if they do this thing, then they can look after themselves and then I don't need to do it and I can shuffle out. It's, 
he's always trying to escape his responsibilities. Lysera is always shouldering all of his responsibilities. And if we look at it from that point of view, oh yeah, Lysera is great and Arathon's terrible. But the flip side of that is a lot of what Arathon does is he's teaching them to be self-sufficient and they don't need to be part of this. Whereas with Lysera, you see that the entire system, structure, alliance is based on him. Without him, that house of cards falls apart. Without him there to be the focal point, to give the rising speeches, to be the figurehead, to be the example of this victim of the evil dark machinations of Arathon. Without him, none of this would all fall apart. Mm. And that it, it, it's such a wonderful, they are so similar and yet so radically different. And how Wurtz has managed to create people that close together in what they do and yet so radically different in what they do in the same package it, it's just a wonderful example of what you can do with with writing yeah yeah absolutely fantastic um i think that's a beautiful thought to go towards the end here do you all have anything more you wanted to talk about with this discussion I think we touched on all the major stuff. I'm sure we missed something or other. Um, it's just not possible to cover everything in a book that rich in the time that we've had. But, but yeah, this was a really fun discussion to cap off what has been a great read. I'm really looking forward to returning. Speaking of which, I, I think our next discussion is going to be in September, right? About war host of Vastmark. Is that correct? Is that our goal? Okay, I, I, I mean, <laughs> I'll work on it. I think you and I are the ones who are And I, I assume that uh, AP, you would be hosting that one. I, I would be delighted to host you on my channel, Joanna. I, I will put <laughs> up with hosting the Nemesis on my channel because this, these books, and maybe you know people haven't noticed my effusive praise for them. I genuinely am enjoying them. They, they are so much fun. They're so engaging. And I know, I, I think some people might be disappointed because this is kind of the first half of a book, um, the way that the, the narrative is split up. And some people might be disappointed there isn't more action in mm. this particular uh, novel. And yet, even with that, even thinking, oh, well, this is set up for the second half, there are still sequences action sequences battle sequences things that are riveting on the page and even those performances of music from mm -hmm. Halloran and then later Arathon those are are almost action sequences that that's something powerful and evocative that is happening on the page that just arrests your attention and so there's a wonderful complexity to this that on the surface can appear so simplistic oh Arathon's the good guy Lysair's the bad guy and yet, if you take a moment to think about what we're being shown, you realize how wonderfully complex this is, that that's an oversimplification of what is happening. We have the frame narrative. We have these different perspectives of these characters. We have the similarities between them, and yet the divisions between them. We see all of this character work of these individuals, some working in one direction and, and others working in others coming into conflict or coming into um, synergy. And, and it's this beautifully realized, deeply intricate, wonderful world, all communicated in complex prose that at times is incredibly lyrical, at times employs that staccato beat to get across something else, that Wurtz runs the gamut of all of these different literary techniques. And that is just exciting for, for me to see. So that was the only thing I wanted to add at the end. Oh, that's beautifully said. Yay. Did you want to add anything, Philip, at the end here? No, that, that was wonderful. Um, just thank you for hosting and um, looking forward to continuing in the series. Ah, uh, same here. Well, thank you both so much. And I look forward to meeting you both for uh, the next one, the next installment. So thanks everybody for watching and have a great rest of your day. Bye. Mm -hmm.